Good morning and welcome to Christchurch Where. It's lovely to be able to see you wherever you are joining us from this morning. And this Sunday is the special Sunday. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the Sunday when Jesus sent his spirit to fill his disciples. They were just waiting, gathered. They've been waiting till he ascended to heaven. And then the Holy Spirit came. And as the Holy Spirit came, they were equipped and empowered. They were able to connect with Jesus in a new way. They were able to do the things that Jesus did. They were able to speak freedom and life. And so it's almost as if this is the moment that the church was fully birthed again. And you know, that first experience of the disciples is an experience that is open to us each and every day, not just on Pentecost Sunday, but a refilling of the Spirit each and every moment. For all of us run dry, all of us get tired, all of us get weary at different times, and yet God himself longs to refresh and to renew and to bring us his peace. And so as we're gathered this morning, I invite you, wherever you are, just to open your hands as a sign of openness to him. And then I'm going to pray that God reveals and fills you even more by his spirit. So just open your hands where you are. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity of gathering together on this Sunday, this Pentecost Sunday. We thank you for the way that you are with us and the way that you stand alongside us and the way that your Holy Spirit rests upon us just like on the early church with tongues of fire. Wherever we are waiting this day, Will you fill us once again with your Spirit? Will you open our eyes to see you and our ears to hear you? And will you help us to encounter you in new and deeper ways as we worship this morning, as we reflect on your Word, and as we pray together? So come, Lord Jesus. Come by your Spirit and release us in praise of the Father as we sing our first song together now.
This week we're back in the book of Ephesians, that letter that was written by Paul from prison. And this part begins finally. Why? Because these were real instructions that were needed to be given to the church. They were really important instructions as to how to stand firm. The letter had begun in prayer, expounding both great theology and prayer for you and me and for the church and the place we have. And last week, while we had a little look at Elisha, we became so aware of how God surrounds us and protects us. Well, in today's passage, we get to see how we stand firm, how we stand firm as Christians and how we are then filled by the Spirit while the Spirit puts the word in our hands and the Spirit releases us in prayer, that we might always stand. You'll see that repeatedly as the message is read in a minute. And that thing of standing is an important motif of standing firm when everything else seems to be changing or moving around, standing firm on God. So as you listen to the reading this morning, allow those words of standing firm just to stand out to you that you might hear and understand what God is saying to us. Today's reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Paul is writing to the Ephesians about the armour of God. Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Finally, begins Paul. Finally, be strong. Be strong in what? Be strong in our own strength that lets us down. No, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Paul is reminding us his mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Be strong in God and in his mighty power. And in so much of Paul's letters, it's all about partnership. It's all about that partnership language. Be strong in God as we choose to rest in him. Be strong in God as we choose to put on the whole armor of God. It's partnership because God's mighty power is there for us. And it's in that way that Paul is saying, stand, stand firm, be strong in God. You see, life sometimes seems a struggle. Paul's very aware of this. Paul's sitting there in chains. It's a bit like a train that has no longer got any track to run on. It's as if it's in the desert, not going anywhere. The reality is Paul was chained up. He was locked up. He wasn't able to get out. He was an ambassador who should have been able to be freely roaming and talking and sharing. But for Paul, wherever he was, he was going to keep going. He was going to keep sharing and keep speaking truth, no matter what the struggle is. For us, sometimes we have those struggles. Maybe the struggle just to pray. 
maybe the struggle to learn a bit more about our faith, or the struggle to forgive someone when we know we should, or the struggle just to have peace. We recognize that there are struggles in our lives so often, and sometimes we only see the struggle that is right in front of us. But Paul here is wanting to remind us that, yes, there are struggles in our circumstances, but there are also struggles that are part of a far bigger struggle. The bigger struggle of good versus evil, of God winning the world back to him. You see, when Paul talks about evil, Jesus himself talked about it. Deliver us from evil. It's part of the prayer that we are told to pray. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces that would often seek to derail us. But Paul wants us to know that there's nothing to be frightened of, that actually we can stand firm when there are struggles, when there are temptations, when there are things that come our way. For God is with us and God is for us. C.S. Lewis put it like this. There are two equal but opposite errors into which we can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The reality is God has won a victory and he's for us. You see, where does Paul locate today's reading in the Christian story? It's really simple. God created us. He created the world and saw that it was good. And he created you and me. And in that part of Genesis, God says it's very good. You and me are very good. But the reality is that we gave the world over to Satan. And God said, I don't want to leave you in a place, a stuck place a hard place, a place distant from me. And so he said, I'm going to come and rescue you. And so he sent Jesus to live amongst us. And we saw that Jesus wrestled and struggled, whether in the days of temptation in the wilderness or whether in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus struggled like we struggle, but he was without sin. He died in our place. He rose again and he ascended for us. And one day he's coming back. And when he died, Paul says in Colossians that he made a spectacle of all evil. He defeated it. It's gone. It's done. But it won't be fully removed until he comes back. And so God tells us to stand firm in this world. Stand firm as his kingdom continues to come. Stand firm in his love and his presence and power. And God promised his spirit to be with us, to strengthen us, to lead us and to guide us, to equip us and to anoint us as we live in our everyday. And so Paul is saying our part to play now is to continue to bring God's kingdom in and through us as we stand firm. And what Paul did was he took an everyday illustration. He took the illustration of a Roman soldier and he said, look, in the same way that they go into battle, you in your spiritual life need to be aware. You in your spiritual life need to put on the armor of God. And so in doing so, I want you to open up your scriptures I want you to have a little look at verse 14. I want you to see what Paul actually says. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that we must be able to do is to learn to read the word for ourselves and learn to be able to remember it and use it, as you'll see in a moment. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm with the belt of truth. The things that God actually says, the fact that God did die for you, the fact that God does love you, the fact that you are forgiven in him, the fact that nothing can separate you from the love of God. The belt held everything together. The truth of God holds our lives together. And after the truth, the breastplate of righteousness, it covered the heart. It protects the heart. 
The reality is so often we can get bruised and damaged. We can have the wind knocked out of us. But God wants us to put on the breastplate of righteousness, to know that we are forgiven, that we are right with God. And therefore, as we're right with God, our hearts can be placed in his hands, the place where we can trust and where he will always lead and guide and follow. To put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then your feet, verse 15, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Jesus Christ died to bring us peace with God and peace with each other. When you put on shoes, they're put on not only to protect your feet, but to help you to go somewhere. As you go, as your disciples, not only do you have that peace with God, you're called to bring peace to the people around you. Maybe with words of kindness, maybe with words of truth, maybe with acts of love. But it's peace. We're told, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. We put on shoes to go somewhere and to share the peace and the love of God. And in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The Roman shields were big and massive and they were held in front, two straps held tight, and they locked together. The reality is that one soldier with one shield was vulnerable, but when they came together, when they stood together, they could withstand anything and they could stand firm and take one step forward and one step forward and one step forward. You see, that's the reality. We, as God's people, are called to stand firm. But as Paul's been talking about in the letter to Ephesians, to stand together. For together we can protect one another. Together we can support one another. Together we can love one another. And together we can go out and share the peace of God. And so we come to the last item of armor. Sorry, second to last. Take the helmet of salvation. The thing that protects your mind and your head. All your thinking. Salvation that Jesus has died for you. Paul talks about taking capture every thought. Protect your mind with the knowledge of God and capture each and every thought. And so then the last weapon, which was the short sword. It wasn't a really long one for going far away. It was a short one because it was used alongside each other to protect as well as for offensive. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Works in two ways. The very words that God give us to speak at any given moment. And the truths of scripture already in his word. You see, Jesus, when he struggled in temptation, used the word of God to actually stand firm. But also sometimes you're reading scripture or someone might share a part of scripture with you and it just goes, oh, that's real to me. I didn't have peace then. Or I needed more love then. Or I really needed to know that truth. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's God's very words given in power, the power of the Spirit. His words at the right moment, at the right time, can absolutely transform and change us and change the world around us. And His words, when we declare them, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. God does. When we declare them, the peace of the Lord be here, it happens. It's words in the power of the Spirit. And then Paul wants us to really know one other thing that fills and enables us to completely connect. And it's not given a title as a piece of armor because Paul is expecting us just to do it. It's really simple. It's that whole part of prayer. Pray in all times, in all ways, in all circumstances, in all occasions. Verse 18. Be alert. You see, Ephesians started with extended prayer. It was one long sentence that Paul just couldn't stop praising God about. 
You know, so often it's good that we pray when we first wake up or maybe just before we go to sleep. But sometimes that's like a minute or so. It's as if, oh, we might just do this to reorientate to the day. Here, Paul is wanting us to say something really different. He's saying, be aware, be alert, don't fall asleep. They echo Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane to his friends. Stay alert, keep watch, be aware. You know, it's good that we do the one minute at the beginning or end of the day. But sometimes that's as good as sometimes having a piece of stale bread when we wouldn't have anything else to eat. God actually longs for us to really eat well to engage well and to live well. He longs for his world of the spirit, his good world, to infuse everything that we do. And that's talked about here in terms of prayer, walking and talking with God, listening to God, the very spirit in our hearts and lives, reminding us of truths, telling us things, showing us things, maybe even directing our feet to go somewhere to go and share, or to love, or to pray. Pray in all kinds of ways. Pray in the Spirit. Pray connected to Jesus. For there's no point just putting on the armor of God and then pretending he doesn't exist. He's saying, be aware of me. Be aware of me because I am with you. I am with you when you step out of the house this week. I am with you when you go to the supermarket. I am with you when you go to work or to school or the hospital. I am with you. And wherever you are, because I am with you, you are safe. You are protected. You can stand firm in my truths. You can know my presence and you can pray by my spirit. For nothing can ever separate you from my love. Stand firm then, Paul is saying to the church. Stand firm and stand together. Be filled with my spirit. Be strong in my mighty power that comes from the spirit. Stand and be filled. Stand together in truth. Stand together in love. Stand together in strength and purpose. And pray. Whether you're indoors, outdoors, whether you're connected or not connected, we can be together in prayer. You see, sometimes as we pray, we wonder what goes on. The reality is, as we pray in the Spirit, the world changes and God's kingdom comes. So what I encourage you to do this day, go away and look again at this passage. Spend time dwelling in this passage. Spend time understanding this passage. Spend time thinking about how you can grow in truth and knowledge of the word. And spend time in asking God to fill you with his spirit that you might be moved to pray in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of circumstances. And I promise you that as you stand there, standing firm in God, knowing the truths that we've looked at in Ephesians, speaking the truths of God, praying the truths of God, you will see God's kingdom come and you'll be moved in ways that you have never, ever dreamt or imagined before. You will see the reality of the world of God transforming the world around us. And so let's just pray on this Pentecost Sunday. So we pray, just invite you just to pause. Pop down your tablet or your phone or the Bible just for a second. Just rest in his presence. Lord Jesus, we thank you that where your word and spirit come together, you are with us. And where your word and spirit come together, the world is changed. Will you, wherever we are, pour your spirit this Pentecost into us? Help us to put on your armor that we might stand firm. But help us to see your kingdom come. Help us to see your will be done here on earth. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to look to you and to receive you. Help us to know your truths that, this, that transcend both time and space. 
grant us a real knowledge of your love this day. And so, Lord Jesus, as we continue just to sing of your truth, will you continue to come by your Spirit, transform our minds and our hearts, and teach us to pray in truth this Pentecost. In your name, amen.
one of the things that we would have often done on a Sunday is be able to talk and share with one another about what's going on in our lives. And so just before our intercession today, Alison, who's one of our local heads, is just going to share some of the things so that we can be praying for her and for others as well. Friday the 20th of March was a sad and emotional day for many of us in school as we closed the schools for lockdown, particularly for the year sixes who didn't know whether they'd be coming back again, and personally for myself because I'm retiring at the end of the summer term. But as a school community, we met together on the school field and we had a wonderful time of collective worship where we prayed for one another. And we finished by singing and signing, as we often do, the words of Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Well, like many schools, we've had challenges, home learning, technology, keeping in touch with the whole school community, managing the emotions of children, parents and staff, personal situations of members of staff, caring for one another as a team, how to safely keep the school open to provide for the key worker children. But in my office, I have a poster that says, Lord, help me to remember that nothing's going to happen today that you and me can't handle together. So as a school community, we've come together at 8.30 every morning to pray for the school community, whether in school or virtually in our homes. And our prayers have been answered in many joyous ways, particularly hearing about families spending time together, enjoying the outdoors, and particularly reconnecting with God's wonderful creation. It's amazing to hear all the bird song. We've seen the key worker children skipping in, smiling, and we've all enjoyed the wonderful sunshine. Well, could I ask that you pray for head teachers and senior leaders of schools across the country as they now come together to find out how they can safely bring their children back in. Every school is in a very different situation. Well, I never thought that my last term would end like this, but it's been an amazing privilege to be a head teacher, and particularly at this time, because I've had wonderful opportunities to share my faith through conversations with staff and through the newsletter which each week ends with these words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And that's my prayer for every one of you. As our service began, we opened our hands. As we pray today, we are going to use our hands. Our little finger represents children. We have heard from Alison and she has asked us to pray for schools. We pray for teachers and for pupils, having had half term and returning to learning, be that in their classrooms or virtually. We ask for motivation and peace as things happen differently. Our next finger is our ring finger. As people have been forced together, we pray for our relationships. Thank you for our spouses and partners. Help us be patient and loving with each other. We pray for those who are due to be getting married at this time. Where weddings are done differently, we pray for patience and love. Our next finger is our big finger. We pray for the big things that are happening in this world. Wars and unrest continue. Let us remind ourselves of the big things we were praying for at the beginning of the year. Let us pray for the big things that are filling our minds at this moment. Our next finger is our pointy finger. We pray for those in leadership, our government and councils, and all those who are making such key decisions. Give them wisdom as decisions are made. Fill us with your grace as we hear those decisions. May each one of us seek you in what we should do. As we finish with our thumbs, when God created humans, he saw it was very good. We pray for ourselves, whether we are feeling good or bad, happy or sad. Thank you that you are a good God and love and care for us. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 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 Well, it's the time of the service now where my family will always laugh at me over lunch afterwards because it's that time when I say it wouldn't be a service without the notices. And the only notice that I've really got this morning is that as our life changes, as we start to be released a little bit more, being given that bit more freedom back, one of the things I'd love to encourage you to do is maybe as you uh, meet up or maybe two meters away in your small groups, having that kind of little wonder and actually going down the road and praying. Maybe just take this opportunity to stop in twos or threes, just in different points around the town or wherever you live, and just to pray for those houses, to pray for those businesses, to pray for those schools. For if Paul calls us to pray in all kinds of ways, why don't we use this opportunity as we're enabled to pray and to see God change? In the same way that the disciples waited and prayed and God filled them at Pentecost, in this time of change, why don't we use those opportunities just to pray together? Or even as your family goes for a walk this afternoon, maybe just to pray together at some point along the way as you stop and maybe watch the dragonflies on the river down here. Take these opportunities to pray. And if you wish, Cheryl's running uh, the Zoom prayer meeting on a Friday morning as well. We'd love to see you there. Do come and join. The details are available from the office. Let's be a people that are preparing the way as we pray ahead. For the reality is we are safe with God. And as we pray, we see his victory. And so let's join in with our last song this morning. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe in. Because the God I serve knows all. How to triumph, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. Cause I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There is power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant Cause I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends Cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Take 
speak what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you And so for our blessing today, I'm going to turn to the letter of Jude, verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great, great, great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, that as you trust in him, you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit, both this day and every day. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you, remain with you, and flow from you wherever you are this day. In his name. Amen.